I am Bill Hobbs, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about satellite navigation. Um, the presentation goes over some of the history of satellite navigation, what is in a GNSS receiver, how the receiver figures your location, error sources, and increasing accuracy. There is a very simple example of figuring one's location that is similar to how these systems do it. Some of the details presented here are specific to GPS, but other GNSs like GLONASS, Galileo, <laughs> Galileo BDAO2 have very similar concepts. I am not a GNSS engineer or scientist. I'm a programmer analyst, like it was uh, John said, who thinks GNS is kind of neat and did, and I did a lot of reading on the net about it. It is quite possible that I completely misunderstood something and have it uh, have it very wrong here. But I, this is what I think is uh, how GNS works, and there seems to be quite a few websites that agree with me. Um, the answer to the question shown, how could a satellite 20,000 kilometers away possibly tell me where I am, is that the satellite does not tell you where you are at. The satellite tells you where the satellite's at and the time the message was sent. It's up to you to figure out where you are. And hopefully I can show you how that works. For some folk, being lost happens to other people. These are a couple of uh, sayings, phrases that I came upon and thought would be kind of interesting. For this presentation, navigation is determining one's position. There are several satellite systems for navigation. Some are fully operational, like GPS and GLONASS. Some are partially, op partially operational, like Galeo and BDAO. As Sputnik approached and left their station, some US scientists noticed that the frequency of the satellite's radio signal changed by the Doppler effect, similar to how a siren sounds higher pitched approaching and lower pitched leaving. After some study and measurements, the scientists were able to determine where Sputnik was in its orbit just by measuring the frequency shift and knowing the orbit. The scientists figured that if they could determine where a satellite was from a known Earth position, they also could determine an unknown Earth position from a known satellite position. Satellite-based navigation is born. Each transit satellite broadcasts its ephem ephemeris, a description of its orbit, and the time. The time was used to determine where the satellite was in its orbit. With this information and the Doppler shift of the broadcast, one's position on Earth could be calculated to within 20 meters using one satellite. Originally developed so that U.S. submarines could determine their location prior to launching nuclear missiles, there were usually five operational satellites in orbit plus in-orbit spares. It could take up to 60 minutes to compute a location. A transit satellite assist, uh, excuse me, a transit receiver assisted in updating the elevation of Mount Everest in the 1980s. Some say that NAVSTAR stands for Navigation System Timing and Ranging. Others say some admiral liked the name Navstar and it stuck. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia launched the remaining GLONASS satellites and achieved operational status. 
In the late 1990s, Russia had trouble maintaining GLONASS. The first satellites had a design life of three years, and many of the old satellites were not replaced. By 2001, there were only six operational GLONASS satellites from a full constellation of 24. Starting in 2001, Vladimir Putin made it a priority to restore GLONASS to full operational status and a complete constellation. The U.S. military and Congress knew this was going to be very, very expensive. At the time, during the Cold War, there were very few reasons for the system, for the GPS system. Navigation for nuclear forces may have been the only reason. Initially, the entire GPS system was highly classified. In 2013, it was estimated that GPS benefited the U.S. gross do domestic product, GDP, by about 0.3%, or $56 billion. Farmers track their crop yields by the square meter and exactly where pesticide and fertilizers are needed. Construction projects precisely sculpt the ground at a site. Trucking companies and delivery services track their vehicles. Consumers have in-car map services, do geocaching, play Pokemon Go, and track pets. The U.S. military still operates and maintains the GPS system. And this is what $12 billion buys, or something very similar to it. There's a point uh, somewhere in Colorado that it, it is illustrating there with the red lines and showing the number of visible satellites. So as time goes by, the satellites change. But this gives you an idea of what's going on out there. This is one of the first portable GPS receivers. It has one channel. 1,400 units were manufactured between 1988 and 1993, and each cost $45,000. It weighs eight kilos. Because of the weight, many were mounted on a truck or helicopter. This was used during, these were used during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. Today, we have a handheld, weighs 160 grams with batteries. I believe it has 12 channels and it can use GPS and GLONASS satellites. It lists for $300, the Garmin. On the right, something for hobbyists. It has an MTK 3339er chipset, 66 acquisition channels, 22 tracking channels. The In the center there, the, uh, on top, that is a patch antenna. So it has its own built-in antenna. It can also use an external antenna. It lists for $40. Now inside, some of the things that go on. The acquisition segments scan the antenna output for satellite signals. The receiver knows the frequency, spread spectrum parameters, and other characteristics of the GNSS systems it has been programmed for. A single receiver may be able to receive multiple systems, as in uh, GPS, GLONASS, BDAO, Galeo, whatever's available. Some systems can only deal with, or some receivers can only deal with a single system, for instance, only with GPS. The receiver may not know where any of the satellites are at the start, so the receiver listens for any satellite. This is where all those channels become useful. Each channel can listen for a specific satellite all at the same time. Once a satellite signal is acquired, the tracking segment takes over and gathers information about the satellite signal. 
the ephemeris, time, almanac, satellite health, status messages, etc. Once enough satellite information has accumulated, the application segment selects satellites and their data to use in the calculations. If a later segment determines the quality of a satellite has deteriorated too much, that satellite is dropped and a replacement is selected from an earlier segment. On the left are the equations that the first GPS receivers used. I suspect that similar equations are used in today's GPS receivers, but they are much more sophisticated using more than four satellites, smoothing the results faster, etc. Anyway, on the right is our equation for the real simple example. The example will be taking place in simple world, a one dimensional world sig where signals travel one distance unit and one time unit. There are no errors or accuracy problems. The top equation on the right results in our location. Once we know where we are, the bottom equation will tell us, will give us the current time. The following few, few slides show the process of converting the left equations to the right equations. It is high school algebra, though my teachers might scold me for being overly clumsy. I'm just going to flip through them quickly. If you are interested, get the PDF or slide set for this presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Simple World. Some might say that all this is, is a line segment with numbers from 15 to 44. Well, you're pretty close. You forgot that signals travel one length unit in one time unit on this numbered line segment. The government of Simple World constructed two stations to broadcast the time and the station's location. This was very expensive and very risky because someone had to be lowered down to read the numbers underneath each station. But before that, they had to develop and deploy a second dimension to be lowered into. Remember, this is one dimensional. Anyway, the stations are at 18 and 40. Nothing special about either location, except that there is a station there. Welcome X0 to Simple World. X0 doesn't know where she is, but we can see that she is at marker 27. Shortly, she will receive messages from the stations, but first we need to figure out the timestamps for the messages the stations will broadcast. X0 receives a message from each station at the same time. The further stations messages will have an older timestamp. We need to calculate what the correct difference is between those timestamps. For this example, the difference is four. I picked 33 for X2's timestamp, add four and X1's timestamp is 37. These are the messages that X0 receives at this time. If she waited, say, three time units, the next messages would have T40 for X1 and T36 for X2. Using the simplified equations, the location of X0 can be calculated from the messages sent by the two stations using just the location of the stations and time of transmission. After the position is calculated, the correct time can also be calculated. This is how GPS and the other systems, GNS systems work. Though they do it in three dimensions instead of just one. Well, three dimensions in time instead of one, one dimension in time.
you take your shiny new GNS receiver, hook up a recording device, set the rig outside with a good view of the sky and bad words and foul language. The device is obviously broken. It can't seem to figure out where it is. Current GPS has about a 15 meter accuracy. From these uh, illustrations here, you can see that the location is wandering around most of it within 15 meters, but it's still kind of annoying that uh, it's not locking on to a single place, especially seeing as how these receivers were sitting. The following slides show the main error sources, starting with the largest potential errors. The ionosphere, upper atmosphere, 50 to 1,000 kilometers up. Charged particle densities refract and slow the signals from the satellites. Slow changing compared to the troposphere, which will be uh, on a later slide. Dilution of precision is a calculated value that represents the quality of the satellite positions seen by the GNS receiver. There are several flavors of DOP. Some DOPs are constructed from simpler DOPs down in the lower left or middle left. If the satellites are spread out, that will result in a low DOP value, which is good. If the satellites are bunched together or in a straight line, that will result in a high DOP value, which is not so good. The blue areas on most of the map are good DOP values. The darker blues are better DOP values. The red area in the upper right is poor, represents poor DOP values, seven or higher. Some GNS receivers calculate DOPs to determine the best combination of the available satellites to use. Satellite clock. Each GPS satellite carries four clocks, but they do drift. Measured and corrected, uh, the drift is measured and corrected by the ground stations. Now at the speed of light, 10 nanoseconds is equivalent to three meters. Satellite orbit. Sometimes the satellite is not where it says it is at. This is measured and corrected by the ground stations. The orbit is affected by the solar wind, the sun, and the, and the moon's gravity. The Earth's gravity field is not uniform. Some GLONASS satellites have a corner reflector for improved laser measurements. Receiver noise. The GNS receiver can generate its own errors or pick up other strong signals that confuse it. The GPS signals are very, very weak. Random noise in the radio band used is stronger than the GPS signals. The GPS signals are designed to be picked out of this noise. I believe the following figures are correct. The signal at the GPS satellite antenna is 500 watts or 27 decibel watts. 20,000 kilometers of signal spreading results in a loss of 182 decibels. The signal at the GPS receiver is minus 155 decibel watts or 316 atto watts. An atto is 10 to the minus 18th power, 
or another way to look at it is a 0 0.17 zeros and a one. Extremely tiny amount. Compare that to an AM or FM broadcast antenna, 50,000 watts or more, and they only have to reach a couple of hundred kilometers. Multipath. Signals can reflect from buildings, trees, the ground, etc. The reflected signal has a longer path than the direct signal, so the signal takes longer. The reflected signal takes longer than the direct signal. I suspect that older GNS receivers at street level in New York City may barely work, if at all. Environments like that are called urban canyons. The troposphere, the lower atmosphere, ground to about 50 kilometers. <clears throat> you have humidity, pressure, and temperature that can cause various delays to the, tra uh, to the satellite signals. The troposphere effects change fast compared to the stratosphere. There are also relativity effects. The Sagna effect has to do with the Earth's rotation and changing coordinate systems. And plus we have special relativity and general relativity, but all of these are compensated for by the satellite or by the receiver. These errors are unchanging. Now, these are a lot of different errors that can add up and cause that wandering of the receiver's location. What can we do about these errors? A good start is having a nice clear open view, not being in those urban canyons, if, if it can be helped. you. There are more satellites are available. You can, the satellite that are used can be spread out, which lowers your DOP and less multipath. <clears throat> now, multiple signals from each satellite. The, ionos the ionosphere can contribute the most error. If a satellite broadcasts on two frequencies, the ionosphere affects the, the two frequencies differently, and a GNS receiver can analyze those differences and compensate for much of the ionosphere effects. The GPS satellites broadcast a second encrypted signal that select receivers can process, mostly military and government receivers. The accuracy of these receivers is about five meters or better instead of the 15 meters a civilian receiver has. GPS satellites launched after 2005 are broadcasting a second clear signal that can be used for ionospheric corrections. So we um, civilians with newer GNS devices should be able to pick up the second signal along with the first signal from each set GPS satellite and be able to correct for the ionosphere. The reference stations. Most location differences have to do with factors external to the receiver that also affect other nearby GNS receivers. So just about everything except for the receiver noise uh, is being referenced here. Put a GNS receiver at a known point like a survey marker, which is what the picture is, uh, uh, a survey marker, and broadcast the differences as adjustments. 
and other GNS receivers that use that information will become much more accurate. GNS re reference stations are at airports and they allow aircraft to land in very poor conditions. So there are various systems out there, the WAS and the DGPS system out there, systems out there that provide local area adjustments to air, uh, air conditions. And they're, these adjustments are good, uh, I believe, up to about 100 kilometers. The further you get away from the reference station generating these um, adjustments, the less those adjustments have to do with your particular area, but uh, still they, they can be a help. <coughs> Pardon me. Now surveying, what they do, uh, surveyors, they will, uh, when they're putting up, let's say a subdivision, they locate known um, survey markers, they, they locate the survey markers, they put reference stations on two or three of those survey markers, build, uh, possibly building a triangle around where they're going to be working at. And in that area, they have now reduced their um, uh, reduce the errors down into the centimeter range and they can quickly go through and mark, mark things, uh, uh, mark the locations that they need to know. This is the end of my presentation and I seem to have run through it fairly quickly, but I now turn this over to uh, the moderator. And moderator's here. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, Bill's got his information up there. Um, if there are any questions, you can use your chat box to uh, give them to us. I've got one question for you, Bill. Are you a ham? No, I am not a radio amateur. I've looked at some of the things that they do and uh, I never really went through, uh, well, way back in the day, it was, you, you had to know, um, Morse code. Uh, I understand nowadays you can get a, uh, a license without Morse code, but no, I am not a ham. Okay. Yeah. I noticed that too. We have a ham person in our computer club and was telling us about the new keyboard, uh, communication. So that would work for me. Okay. Oh, a comment made that kids are always asking, why do they have to learn math? And this person said, I think GPS is a great example that they can relate to. Can I include the calculations of simple word in my curriculum, says a teacher. Yes, yes. Um, those calculations uh, uh, I kind of cobbled together and I have a, a, a friend, Sebastian, who helped me with some of the stumbling in there and I appreciate his help, but it's all pretty much, or at least I hope, uh, high school algebra, uh, though you know, high school for me was way back when, and, you know, s sitting at the feet of uh, Aristotle and Socrates while they rambled on. But yes, please, um, you know, and simplify where, where needed. It's, uh, uh, and I hope I haven't made uh, any gross mistakes in there, but the equations seem to work. Um, 
at least within the limits that I put on Simple World. And uh, they should work for uh, any other uh, Simple World uh, demonstration. But yes, please use them. Okay, now put on your uh, future goggles and your crystal ball. And where do you see this technology going 20 years from now? Oh, 20 years from now. Oh. Well, you, took, you took us back a good 20 years. <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I can see, well, um, all right. Well, one of the things that GPS provides that a lot of people aren't aware of is the correct time. And I can see, a, 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 you know, the, a byproduct of knowing where you are uh, with, the G, uh, with the GNS systems is also knowing what the correct time is. Because once you know where you are, then you can compensate for the 20,000 kilometer uh, uh, distance from the satellites and determine what the, what the time is. And so a lot of devices are now getting time from GNS satellites, um, look, uh, cell phones, uh, cell phone towers are, are getting that uh, so that they can properly charge for their uses. So a lot more devices are going to know what time it is. Um, but uh, anything, uh, you know, and that's happening now, but 20 years from now, um, hmm, I could see outer space becoming quieter, uh, because these signals are so, um, so weak. Uh, like I said, uh, uh an AM FM, a radio station broadcasts at 50,000 watts and these um, these receivers are dealing with you know not milliwatts not microwatts not nanowatts but a couple of more orders of magnitude less um, so you know maybe radio stations will be changing over to spread spectrum um, and you know, instead of saying, yes, 50,000 watts of broadcast power, they'll say, yes, 10 watts of broadcast power. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm not sure where this is going to go. Um, it, it, it changed a lot from the Sputnik and the transit you know, where you had one satellite and using Doppler effect to, um, to now uh, using at least four satellites and kind of um, there's some compensation for Doppler effects, but uh, not actually using it. But um, yeah, uh, predicting where this is going. I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why most of us are very poor because we don't see all the big things mm -hmm. in the future uh, what about can you tell us um, what frequencies do the systems use um, no <laughs> uh, but I can tell you a little bit uh, about that I, I, I had some notes here of things that that might possibly be asked and frequency, the actual frequencies, uh, I, I didn't scribble down, but our GPS, the GPS system uses two different frequencies for all the satellites. So all the satellites broadcast, uh, the, what is called the CA or the course acquisition, uh, signal, which is what we use all 24 satellites broadcast on the same frequency, but they use different pseudo random numbers uh, that they modulate their signals on. So each one has its own pseudo random number that it uses so that it can be differentiated. 
And then modulated on top of that is the actual data stream. The other frequency is the military frequency or the encrypted frequency, which current military and government receivers can use to uh, determine what the ionosphere effects are. So all of our satellites use those two frequencies. Now, GLONASS, they went a little bit different path. I, uh, they have 24 satellites. They use 12 sets of frequencies. Each pair of satellites that are on opposite sides of the Earth use the same frequency pair um, because they're because they're on opposite sides of the Earth. A receiver anywhere on Earth will not be able to receive both of those satellites at the same time. Um, so you can see where having uh you know in the um in the chip where it had 66 search or uh, acquisition channels uh for gps satellites it had uh each channel is on the same frequency but has a different pseudo random uh number and for glonass satellites uh they're using different free frequencies that they're searching for, for those satellites. So, um, that's a little bit about, um, about the different frequency or the frequencies that they're, they're, they're all kind of bunched up, uh, together, the, the frequencies that they use, uh, or that they are allocated by the, um, oh, the, what is it? The international, uh, I think it's a, um, a function of the UN that allocates uh, frequencies like that. But um, that's that's what, off the top of my head what I can think of about the frequencies. This is a good question. The person said they are assuming that civilian non-military GPS works in Europe, South America, and so on. Are any of these countries providing their share of the funding for this network, or is the U.S. taxpayer supporting it 100%, if you knew? I believe it's 100% U.S. taxpayer supported. It just happens that it works on the rest of the planet. Um, but remember the economic benefit of, uh, of the system. It's... Uh, here in the U.S., it's fifty-six billion dollars, and probably worldwide, it's um, a, a similar figure. And the cost of operating the system is about a billion dollars a year. So, um, and then Europe is putting up the Galileo system, uh, which will uh, add to it. And there's the GLONASS, and then the Chinese. Um, uh, BDAO system, uh, there's going to be a lot of satellites up there. Somebody's have to go up there and do traffic control. <laughs> well, they're in slightly different orbits uh, or distances. Um, so if uh, uh, I, I don't have the actual numbers, but if GPS is at, let's say, 20,000 kilometers, GLONASS, I think, is at like uh, 19,500 kilometers, Galileo may be at 21,000 kilometers. Um, BDAO, if I recall correctly, uh, they have some satellites at, you know, whatever altitude, uh, let's say 19,000 kilometers, but they also have a few satellites that are in geostationary orbit. So they're out there uh, about 36,000 kilometers. And they, if you could see it, it would appear to be stationary in the sky. A GNS satellite or broadcaster, I should say, that, that's broadcasting the location uh, and the time doesn't have to be a satellite in motion. It, it can... Uh, it, rel or motion relative to the ground, it can be in geostationary orbit or it can be the 
highest tower in town uh, broadcasting that information. As long as it's broadcasting the correct location and the correct time, those, um, it could be a motion, it can be sitting there, uh, just as long as it's broadcasting the right information. Uh, one person said that they, they do some calculus, but not the physics and differential uh, geometry. And they're interested in learning more about these uh, relativistic effects. Um, would you have any suggestions on any intro level material for someone to start their studies? Oh. Um, no, uh, I suggest that you Google uh, GPS relativity and or GPS special relativity or uh, GPS uh, general relativity and see what comes up. Um, a lot of it, I suspect, would probably come from the uh, .edu websites uh, on that type of thing. Um, there, uh, if you, um, there were some college courses on GPS or, or uh, GNS navigation uh, and how it works. Um, some of them might be online, uh, or some of their, uh, class materials might be available. But, uh, That's good. So you yeah. did have a little idea. <laughs> okay. I don't see any other questions right now. Uh, if you do have any questions, the chat box will stay open and you could submit those and we'll send them on to to bill uh, if not bill i'm going to thank you very much for a very technical and uh, interesting presentation on the satellites that are up there that we can't see but we know they're watching us uh, so i'll thank you for that and the, taking that time to uh, help us out and uh, if there's nothing else, we will let you stop sharing your your screen. Well, uh, uh, you're welcome, and I uh, thank you, uh, John, and uh, the viewers for coming in and listening to me uh, ramble on. And I.